Welcome back to Nefertim Online Project Lectures. Uh, in this lecture, we will uh, talk about hypercalcemia. We discussed in the last lecture hypercalcemia in a practical way. And also we discussed before uh, both electrolyte, uh, both sodium and the potassium uh, disturbances, hyper and the hypo disorders. And then this is uh, for hypercalcemia. As uh, I always saying, I'm always saying that our lectures are available in both English and Arabic languages on our YouTube channel and the PowerPoint on the website. And Nephrotube team makes a lot of activities on the Nephrotube uh, group and page on Facebook. Regarding, regarding calcium homeostasis, we discussed uh, it in details in the uh, previous lecture about hypocalcemia, so I will not go in depth through it. If you need uh, to uh, listen to it again, please go back to the last lecture. But I want to mention the most important point is to measure or to calculate corrected calcium whenever there is a uh, abnormal serum albin of the patient. Because uh, uh, the patient may uh, be normal calcemic in the lab, but at the same time, he is hypoalbuminemic. And with correction of the serum calcium to albumin, the patient will be diagnosed as hypercalcemia. So it is important always to uh, investigate both the serum calcium and serum albumin at the same time to correct the serum calcium. Actually, our lecture today is a very short lecture. Uh, I will discuss first clinical presentation of uh, hypercalcemia. Back to the physiological principles, hypercalcemia always uh, causes decreased excitability of the nervous system and the excitable tissue of the body. That's why you will find in the central nervous manifestations of hypercalcemia, lethargy, weakness, confusion, and coma. And by the way, all the manifestations of the hypercalcemia are not specific to hypercalcemia. And in most of the uh, circumstances, hypercalcemia is diagnosed by the lab measures. Regarding the renal effect of hypercalcemia, we find polyuria and bacteria is because calcium ion, as the same as potassium ion, are integrated in the action of the ADH at the cellular level. And you will find dehydration because of the polyuria and nocturia, and for sure, maybe renal stones, and finally, renal failure. Regarding gastrointestinal effect, you find constipation because of the decreased excitability of the smooth muscles of the gastrointestinal system because of hypercalcemia. Constipation will be um, associated with nausea, anorexia, and finally calcium precipitation in the pancreas causing pancreatitis and gastric cancer. Finally, there may be cardiac effects of hypercalcemia. In the ECG, you will find short QT interval, and the QT interval always uh, parallel, always is parallel to the cardiac activity, and in hypercalcemia, you will find short QT because the ST segment will be slower, and the ST segment usually is related to the plateau of the uh, cardiac muscle action potential, which is totally dependent on the calcium ion beside the potassium. This is regarding the clinical presentation what about diagnostic approach. This is a classical diagnostic approach that is present in different uh, literature, literatures and references. First of all, you have to do PTH. If the PTH is elevated, so this may be primary hyperparathyroid disc. If it's mild to upper normal or mildly elevated, this might may be primary hyperparathyroid disc or the familiar cause. I will talk about it uh, in the next slide. If it is low, normal or low, so this is an pH mediated hypercalcemia. PTH here is low because of the normal physiological negative feedback of the hypercalcemia of the par parathyroid gland. So if it is not PTH related, as it is mentioned here, you have to measure PTH related protein. 
125 bar hydroxyvitamin D and 25 hydroxyvitamin D. Actually, the 25 hydroxyvitamin D is available in most of the countries and can be measured. 125 bar hydroxyvitamin D is not available, uh, I think, in most of the countries because its level in the blood is very low and it is difficult to be measured. The PTH reactive protein present in some countries and some are not. So if the PTH rated protein is high, so you have to search for malignancy as a cause of hypercalcemia. If you don't have this lab investigation in your country, so you have to exclude by history, by physical examination, by clinical signs, the presence of malignancy. Check if there is weight loss, if there is um, hemoptysis, if there is uh, history of smoking, if there is persistent non-diagnosed uh, anemia, you have to exclude malignancy. Then, if you have 125, and I don't think that, that anyone uh, or uh, a little who will have this uh, lab investigation, if it is high, so the patient may have a lymphoma or sarcoidosis tuberculosis. So if you don't have this lab investigation in your uh, area, you have to exclude all this by, again, by history, clinical examination, by chest X-ray, by lymph node examination, by uh, blood uh, investigations. Finally, if the 25 hydroxyvitamin D is elevated, so there may be vitamin D intoxication. If not, you have to search for plasma cell discreases by doing the serum protein electrophoresis, serum protein electrophoresis, serum free like chains, and for sure, nowadays, you can make serum immune fixation. If abnormal, so the patient will be, will have, uh, or the patient have uh, plasma cell discreases if normal, so the patient may be hyperthyroid or vitamin A intoxication. So from the start, if the patient has clinical criteria of hyperthyroidism, you may uh, order lab investigation for hyperthyroidism from the start. And regarding vitamin A intoxication, you can exclude this from the start by drug history. So if we concluded this approach to make it easier, any patient with hypercalcemia you have to check in the drug history for vitamin D intake and vitamin A intake. You may order from the start PTH, 25 vitamin D, and hyper th and the thyroid profile, especially if the patient has uh, 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 hyperthyroidism manifestations. And you have to exclude malignancy by history and examination. And you have to order chest X-ray for the patient and examine the lymph nodes of the patient. I think if you did all of these, you will exclude all the causes of hypercalcemia to diagnose one cause. Regarding this point, which is very common or more common with the pediatric nephrologist than adult nephrologist, the differentiation between primary hyperparathyroidism and the familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia. You have to do this by checking of the 24 hour urinary calcium. If it is low, so it is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. If it is normal or high, so you are talking about primary or tertiary hypercalcemia. So what about the treatment approach? The treatment approach depends on the onset, if it is asymptomatic or symptomatic. Sorry, it depends on the, the presentation, if it is symptomatic or asymptomatic. If it is asymptomatic, and the serum calcium of the patient is below 12. So if there is a reversible cause, treat it and observe. If the serum calcium is more than 12, you have to give saline for rehydration, loop diuretic to increase calcium excretion in urine, calcitonin, loop corticoid, and bisphosphonates. If it is symptomatic, it depends if the symptoms are Danger symptoms or non life threatening. If they are non life threatening, you can again use the medical measures. If it is life threatening, as ECG changes, threaten your pancreatitis, it depends on the renal function of the patient. If the renal function is normal, again, use the medical measures, plus or minus hemodialysis, if the patient is not responding to medical measures. If there is Renal insufficiency, so you there is no space, enough space to give saline, uh, no benefit from loop diuretic because the excretion of uh, uh, calcium will be low. So maybe hemodialysis, uh, one of the first choices, 
and the dialysis must be used by low calcium dialysate, and we use calcitonin and glucocorticoid. So collectively, we can summarize this approach that the patient with hypercalcemia must be treated with medical measures, except if the patient is asymptomatic and they have serum calcium below 12, you may observe, and you may need hemodialysis if the patient has hypercalcemia with severity and insufficiency, or you may need hemodialysis if the patient has functioned kidney but not responding to the medical measures. This is how to use every line of management of hypercalcemia. The most important point in the management of hypercalcemia is the same as different ions, which is you have to frequently check serum calcium, especially at the start of the management, and especially if the patient has um, severe life threatening conditions for fear of overcorrection of hypercalcemia and inducing the hypercalcemia of the patient. So you have to check the calcium at more frequency, with more frequency at the start, then you may decrease the effective frequency as the calcium approaching the normal level and as the patient becomes more stable. Thank you for watching and see you next lecture. We will discuss acid-based disturbances, especially metabolic acidosis. Thank you. See you later.